back in 2013, I was a solopreneur. I was on my own. And to be honest with you, I was, I was kind of living just above broke. I wasn't kind of sinking. I wasn't, I was paying my bills, but it wasn't really kind of making money and, and fulfilling. It was fulfilling in the sense of what I was doing. Uh, that, that was fine. But in terms of the financial fulfillment, it just wasn't there. You know, I, I had this crazy mission. I wanted to help people. I wanted to change the world. So, so for me, it was about making a difference. And actually, to some extent, the eagerness to make a difference sabotaged some of my financial stability. So I was, I was in this cycle of really uh, feast to famine, really. Uh, we'd have great months and then really bad months and kind of it would level out, but we didn't really get anywhere or make any progress. And twice I had to kind of like quit my job. Uh, sorry, twice I had to quit on my, dr my dream of building my own business and I got a job just for the money. But, you know, you take a year doing that and you feel great with the financial bit, the stability and all that kind of stuff. And then I just couldn't stand it anymore, basically. I needed my own thing. I needed to do my own thing. But I knew that this whole up and down inconsistency was going to, put me back into a job if I didn't master it. And um, I picked up on this concept of a flywheel, something that propels and keeps growing. And, um, and uh, you know, I really kind of, the flywheel principle kind of resonated with me. And I was like, I need a flywheel. If I'm going to do this business thing, I need a flywheel. I repeat, it gathers momentum. It positions me as the expert trusted advisor and I didn't really want to kind of try and sell myself because it felt a bit low rent felt a bit kind of like uh, it didn't it didn't experts shouldn't uh, have to kind of push themselves on people to get business um so so I kind of went through this process of like I wanted this but then I was like I was also fearful um, so I was fearful that if I did become the expert and I was the person that people saw as the go-to person for this particular problem, that actually people wouldn't need me because it's like a chicken and the egg. To get that position, you have to share lots of insight and be seen as valuable. But if I share the value, would people want to work with me? And it was kind of this real tension of... How much do I share? Should I share this? What if I share this? Would somebody, would people like, would people do it without me? So it was a massive fear of oversharing. And, you know, the other one is, what if I share something and the competitors steal it and do it better than me? You know, all of these, they're almost stupid looking back on it. Stupid things looking back on it that people would... Um, Oh, I would think, and I know a lot of other people would do. Um, but, I, you know, when you kind of have this moment where you think about all the fears, I suddenly had a moment of thinking about, well, what about, what about if I don't do it? What if I don't share insights? What if I don't do that? What if I don't take action? What happens then? And, and the problem is the fear of losing always is one-sided. It's always about if you do this, you could lose. It never really, you never have the fear of losing from doing nothing for some reason. So uh, the status quo is a powerful thing. In other words, you never fear the status quo. So we should be more fearful and I should have been more fearful of, of staying where I was. And eventually I got to that place where it's like, I cannot keep being in this place. So we need to be more afraid of the value that we're not sharing than the value we are sharing. Um, I mean, everything is online. Let's just face it. Everything is online, right? Uh, the, every bit of tip, medical advice, business advice, it's all there. It's all sat on the internet somewhere, right? So the question is, where does that information come from? Do they find it from us or do they find it from uh, somebody else? Uh, and so when I was a solopreneur, I didn't, you know, Maverick's quite a big organization now, uh, relatively speaking. Uh, you know, we're not a multinational global company, but we are a big, small business. But back then, I didn't need hundreds of clients. Hundreds of clients. I just needed a couple. Uh, um, uh, that's, you know, a couple would have been fantastic. Um, 
But I think if we're honest, we know that people don't buy from strangers. And when I'm thinking about this flywheel and building this flywheel, I knew that people didn't buy from strangers. And I was like, I've got to find a way to turn strangers into clients, basically. How do I turn strangers into clients and do it consistently uh, and not getting icky with it, not getting into low rent, you know, low status, desperate tactics. And, uh, you know, to turn a stranger into a paying client, that's a journey. That, that's a process. I've got to take somebody down. That's not going to happen in one message. That's not going to happen in one day. That's a journey. And if I wanted to build a business that grew well and consistently and, you know, all of that stuff, I've got to be taking people down that journey on a regular basis all the time. So I'll have lots of different people in lots of different places. So my system had to do that. My flywheel had to do that. And what I'm basically doing at this point in my journey, what I was doing was basically understanding the first principles. If you're not familiar with it, it's a scientific theory of, in other words, let's boil this down to the basics. Let's go back, strip it all back and go, what are the absolute essentials here to make this work? And it was, I've got to do the absolute essential things to take a stranger to a paying client. And that's the journey I had to build. That's the system I had to build. That's the process I had to create. Um, and it can't be reliant on algorithms because they change. It can't be reliant on temporary, you know, fads and trends because they change. And I don't want to be reinventing the wheel, reinventing my strategy. And, you know, listeners to this will also not want to, you know, keep reinventing the wheel uh, every time there's a new trend or a new trick. They want to have a process they can work. Uh, <laughs> keep it simple, stupid, right? So that's when I built the flywheel. That's when I built the LinkedIn flywheel. And th this is a, this is, a, there's a nuance here that's really important. Um, my LinkedIn flywheel is not contingent. It doesn't depend on going viral. It doesn't depend on a ton of engagement. It doesn't depend on attracting huge follower numbers. Right. And there's this kind of mad rush, gold rush almost at the moment, crazy hype to if I my content blows up, if I get followers, that will answer all the problems. It won't. It really will not. If you think about it, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, X, whatever you call it these days, all of these channels, right, that we build on and we increase our reach, which is fantastic. But we, we can't, like, lose sight of the fact that, like, a company that doesn't care about you could just take everything you've built away from you in minutes. One switch of a button, and they don't care. It, do, it, it doesn't matter that you use, lose your livelihood. And this is, this is where, you know, a bit of common sense comes. If you're going down the content creator route and you want to be all in on a platform, knock yourself out. But if you're just doing it to build business, right, you need a flywheel that propels your growth without banking on an algorithm or a god on in Silicon Valley loving you and hoping that they don't change things and it destroys your business. So we've seen this time and time again, and, and yet so many people rely on it. And, and some people think, Dean, you talk about social selling and LinkedIn, and you're telling people don't build on those platforms. Yes, I am. I am, because... There's more to life than social media. And yes, they're a tool. Yes, they're useful. Yes, you can meet new people. Yes, you can win business. But it's a tool. It's a channel. And that channel um, changes and adapts. So you need a system that works whether it's on one channel or another. And that's what a flywheel is. It's a process to grow and build your business. So I built this system. And a lot of it, I can't take the credit for everything in the system because some of it is just fundamental marketing principles. But how I've put it together, I think, makes it quite unique because it's good for people who are maybe not natural sellers, maybe people who are selling their expertise, um, subject matter experts, but really don't want to get down and dirty into selling. Now, if you're a salesperson... Uh, we've got other strategies for you, but this this one was not it for the salesperson. The people who like to cold call, the people who like to get a bit more uh, front-footed in the sales piece, this was not that. 
So, so I built this system, and it, it's based on three parts: attracting attention, yeah, uh, nurturing interest, and converting with conversation. Now, I don't want to be pitching people, right? I don't, that, I'm done with that stuff, right? I'm too old for that stuff. I don't want to be pitching people and playing those numbers games that can trash your reputation. So I built a system, and it took me from solopreneur to having a full-time team of 30, and I'm going to explain what it looks like now. So the brilliant thing about having a system, the brilliant thing about having a process to follow, especially when it's designed to position you as the expert is that it creates preference. So when a client prefers to work with you over somebody else, right, it makes a massive difference. So it allows you to create preference and people work with the real you. There's nothing worse, I used to hate this, um, than having to be in a stuffy environment where you feel like you're hiding yourself to fit in or to become acceptable. And um, I could not stand that. When I got to, uh, jobs in the past because I couldn't pay my bills and couldn't get the consistent revenue properly, um, I hated that whole conformity thing and, and conforming with the culture was there. I want to set my own culture. I want to do things my own way. I want to be the real me. And that's why the system where it, it leverages you as the expert really works. And this is what I've been doing. So I don't have to create some fake persona and do all that kind of, oh, look, I'm you know renting a Lamborghini and all that stuff. I don't want to do that. Uh, it's like, it, it just, it's disingenuous, right? It's disingenuous. The amount of people who take, go on holiday, rent Lamborghinis or sports cars and try to pretend that these pictures are their normal life when actually it's the holiday of a lifetime that they've had. I mean, oh, I don't know. Right. So anyway, the system, right? So the attracting phase, the attracting phase, that is really about building their interest, building your visibility, being known, right? Um, in other words, it's just about the name's familiar, the face is familiar, you're, they're aware of you, you're present in their world. That's the first phase. That's about them gelling with your personality, who you are as an individual, your values, your beliefs, and who you are, right? Then the next part of that is the nurture, the over-delivering of value, positioning yourself as the expert in their world. I often talk about it on LinkedIn as becoming the most valuable person in your prospects, your audience's network, so that's about helping them prolifically, not compromising what you sell, but helping them prolifically. And here's the revelation. It doesn't matter how much information you give people, they will still struggle to get the result. I'm not worried about giving everything away that I know. And the reason why I'm not worried is because the expertise I bring to the table is not knowledge it's getting that knowledge deployed to achieve a result. So nurturing with over-delivering of value. So attracting is about them getting to know you and being visible. Nurturing is about delivering value that's going to help those people. It's useful to those people. So you become a valuable person in their network, somebody they want to listen to, somebody they want to engage with, somebody they see as somebody can help with. And I've used numerous different strategies in there. So attracting, I'll often do some content, share my quirks of my personality, some of my backstory, content driven, primarily that one. Nurturing, this doesn't have to be about content. It can be webinars, audio events, lead magnets. There's loads of different ways, blogs, all sorts of different things that you can do in that place to nurture people. Because let's face it, not everybody is in a position to buy right now. And this journey that we talked about earlier is about nurturing people along, not just the journey from stranger to client, but their journey from, um, yeah, I've got a bit of a problem, but it's not hurting at the moment. I don't need to do anything about it to the point where they reach and go, yeah, I really want to do something about this. I really want to get to hear X, Y, or Z, and I think you can help me. So the nurturing is not just about oh, they just need to get to know me. The nurturing is some people are just not ready to buy right now. And if you try and prematurely convert them, they, it won't work. 
Then I, then it's the conversion phase. How do I make it clear that I can help them? The nurturing's done, the trust piece, the value piece, the attracting has helped them get to know me as a person. So there's a no like trust thing going on here. The converting then is about how do I f- take the interested people out of all of the people in my world, whether it be 500, 5,000, five, some will be ready to look at this more seriously. How do I find them and move them forward? And follow up process has become important. If you don't want to sell, yeah, you have to use the nurturing to find the interest. And then you just follow that up. Follow the interest up. It's a very straightforward process. So I'll give you an example. I share content on LinkedIn. I grow my network on LinkedIn. I engage with people on LinkedIn uh, to share my backstory and things on LinkedIn. And then I'll share value pieces in posts, but I'll also do audio events, webinars, lead magnets, and the people who download that, the people come to the audio event, the people who ask questions. I will say to them, here's how I can help you. I will follow them up. Here's how I can help you if you want to talk. Um, So I don't need to be really pushy but I do need to follow up and start conversations with those people. So I show my first full personality because one of the great things about using your personality is it's a filter. You can't pretend to be somebody else for very long. So if I'm me online, then guess what? Some people will buy into me and like my style and some people won't. I don't need to pretend to be something I'm not to win business. I'm a maverick. I'm a bit unconventional. I do things a different way. I'm not everybody's cup of tea. You're not everybody's cup of tea. So that comes across in my content style, the whole approach that I do. And some people love it. Some people don't. But now what I'm doing is building a group of people who love what I do. And they are much easier and more open to buying than somebody else. So I'm offering a ton of value, gated and ungated value, podcasts, audio events, all that stuff. I'm offering massive value either through inboxes, either through content. I'm doing both options and I'm educating people. I'm adding value. And instead of, instead of trying to treat myself like a salesperson and I'm fishing to find it, I'm approaching the world like a doctor. I understand their challenges. I'm trying to understand their challenges, give them recommendations. And when I'm on calls, so let's say I've done an audio event. I've talked about something. I've followed up their interest, uh, started a conversation with them, and I asked for a call to talk it through. I'm approaching that call like a doctor. So I'm going, I've got a patient coming on this call. I've got to help them in some way. Um, so I need to understand their challenges, give them some recommendations, and, and pretty much 99% of the time, I never have to pitch, never have to offer anything, because people say, how can you help me do this, right? And then I will give them the equivalence of the prescription, and then say, hey, I can supply you with the prescription, I can supply you with the treatment plan, if you want it. Um, and that takes all the sales stress away, it makes it easier. Unlike that fishing analogy, where you're trying to find the win, right? Uh, you've got to basically, you've got to basically find somebody and then twist their arm to to go on a call and twist their arm that you're the best choice. You've got to build all that trust in that process. Whereas I'm approaching this from a bit more of a long term thing. I'm building a flywheel that not just not just works today, but works tomorrow, next month, next year, because it's based on human principles, how humans like to buy. Uh, instead of selling, I'm helping people to buy. And that's, that's a real fundamental difference. It might seem like semantics, but I'm actually helping people buy because I'm showing them how I can make a difference. So I'm educating on my offer. I'm approaching the leads like a doctor I'm giving them that prescription of how I can help. And then they're asking me, can they do it? It's a much more relaxed process. It's a much more authentic and natural process. And there's a reason why people distrust salespeople. It's because they're incentivized to sell you something. They're not motivated to help somebody buy. And if it's not a fit to let you go, they, they have to hit a sales target. I have to win clients, you know, we all have to make money. But when you've got a position where you're influencing a group of people and they're on a journey, 
you have enough people in that world to sustain what you're doing. Um, when you have low trust, let me give you an example, and this is why salespeople often struggle with a more direct, um, you know, uh, fishing approach or pitching approach. When there's no trust, yeah, when, when there's no trust established, there's no awareness, no, no, no like and trust, right? You have to be more aggressive, you have to be more volume, and you have to have stronger and more persuasive sales skills. There's no, no getting around it. When I am talking to salespeople and I'm training salespeople, I say, right, if you've got a target and you've got to go at it, of course, you need the skills to be able to persuade, right? There's no denying it. But if you're not that salesperson and you don't have those skills to persuade, if you don't want to be on, on a more aggressive posture in terms of marketing and selling, you need to build massive trust in the market. Now, I'm not talking about millions of people here. I'm talking about how many people do you need to be customers? You probably need, let's say it's 10 clients. We're probably talking about a, you know, a couple of hundred people need to be absolutely trust you. Absolutely trust you. A couple of hundred of the right people, right? You don't need the arm twisting skills if people trust you and can relate to you. You don't need them. Because you've got a system now that takes people from stranger on that journey to a client based on they're aware of you, they can relate to you, and they believe in what you're doing and what you're saying. That's what we've got to do. That's the flywheel in essence. And that's why I do the audio events. That's why I do what I do. It's not because, oh, I hope to amass followers. I'm trying to build mass trust. I'm trying to build belief because if people believe, they buy. So I'm nurturing a lot of people because I'm doing things consistently. So I've got momentum on my side and I'm building it. But you can start this with as little as 200 connections. I've got a client who started with 500 connections and picked up two clients in the first week. Now, that's not representative. Most of the time we say to people it can take three months to get really going and see the fruits of a system. But really, it's a long term strategy. But if you don't have high trust in the market, you will have to basically uh, be more persuasive and better at selling. So my argument is build a system. If you're not if you don't want to be a salesperson, you don't want to be a full time marketer, you want to be building mass trust and belief in you, what you sell, and the value you deliver so that it's easier to close because you're helping people buy. You're treating it like you are the expert. You are becoming the expert. You're positioning yourself as the expert, and you're not selling anymore. You're creating doctor-patient style conversations, which is a massive difference from what the world is doing. So the flywheel is about taking people in on one end and putting people through a process that you become the most valuable person in their world. And the reason why you need that, the fundamental reason why you need that is because you are reducing the sales friction, you are helping people to buy, and you are taking all of the ickiness and unpredictability out of the process. If you go the other way and play every trend, trick, tactic, you will go through, I have to do this now. Oh, that doesn't work anymore. I'll do something else. Oh, that doesn't work anymore. I have to do something else. And you'll spend five, ten years playing different games to win business and win clients when you could be running a flywheel that will consistently work and bring you clients on whatever platform.